series, we'll be presenting on COVID-19 impact on student affairs across the globe towards a heuristic model of student affairs and services. And I was honored to do this research with Brett Perosi, who you've just met, myself, Thierry Lusha, who was kicked out, is about to come back in, and Dr. Lisa Bardil Mascaritolo. She's at the American University of Georgia in the United Arab Emirates. And um, she's not with us today, unfortunately. Here you see a pretty picture of us. Um, and you see on the side an award we got from ACPA, which we were very grateful for. And if you want more details on this presentation, you can see two publications coming up, which is the Journal of Student Affairs in Africa and the Journal of International Students. So you'll see more details. It's much more detailed there. So just to give you an oversight of what we're going to do, one overview, we locate ourselves um, in the UNESCO's SDGs, Global Sustainable Social Justice Model. Um, and it's quite important that we think ourselves, or for us it was important that we think ourselves within this framework. We want to share with you also the overall results of the study, of the responses of student affairs towards the COVID crisis. We discuss regional variations and information related to the global essential services and share developing heuristic model that we developed on the basis of this data. Um, I'm going to move you up, sorry about that, there we go. And share some implications and learnings. There we go. So student affairs, we view two important functions. Student affairs is instrumental in mediating and mitigating factors that relate to student access, persistence, retention, and success. And another key feature of student affairs in the global context is that student affairs paves the way for equitable opportunity in higher education in the pursuit of global and national social justice and human development. The impact of COVID-19, and you probably very familiar with it too, but I, we just extracted sort of five key things that mattered or that, that kind of surfaced for us. Overall, there was an increased students' challenges to access and persistence. It widened the gender gap. It increased teenage pregnancies. It reduced participation in self-determination. And it was a huge setback for human development across the globe. Many universities closed and left students to wait for further, mostly online, in, online instructions. Some students were left with laptops, mobile devices, phones, data packs, and Wi-Fi codes, and some with much less. The concerns remained about fragile infrastructure, network holes, social cultural inequities, and challenging community contexts. Sometimes it just gets stuck, there we go. So we extracted this one from a publication that came in 2010 already, but it is now as, um, as spot on really as it was then. And it's uh, Altbach and Laura Rumbley and Reisenberg, they said, when students step off campus into significant social inequalities or only access education via online modalities, the tool of empowerment and emancipation, especially for vulnerable groups is impaired. And that, um, you know, is spot on um, for today's reality. So we then looked at student affairs responses and we know that they responded, we responded differently depending on a range of factors, including demographics of our student body and the student characteristics and needs, the size, shape and type of institution, what resources were available, Responses differed according to the higher education structure and the regulatory body and governing bodies. We know they were very different. Bangladesh and China had very different governing bodies than um, continental Europe and of course America. And so universities responded different depending on how they were governed, depending on also how they are embedded into a social welfare system and care system. So that also influenced how universities responded. We know, for instance, German universities are embedded into a social welfare system and their responses was very, very different to what we found the African universities were doing. Um, student affairs also responded differently depending on the social norms, culture and socio-political factors surrounding the institution or into which the institution is embedded. 
And then of course, structural macro conditions, including network access, safety and security and all of those factors. So in terms of the study, the purpose of our study was to establish a global network, a global knowledge base on the impact of student affairs responses on students and institutional success, understand the variations of responses and inform on future practices. We had some key clusters. I'll take you briefly through them. We looked at modalities of decision-making, types and stages of university and responses. So how soon student affairs was involved in making this, um, decisions, the financial, financial impact on the crisis, of the crisis, the ongoing services, which services were essential, that kind of thing, communication with students, student leaders, impact on specific student groups and different impact on different groups. And then we looked, we did some questions on looking forward and looking back. Um, in terms of the methodology, um, we used Qualtrics online survey with 59 questions. They were clustered, as I'd said. We used snowball sampling and a lot of you responded to our questions or to the survey. And snowball sampling um, was really about uh, disseminating the survey via our networks um, and uh, via newsletters and websites. And of course, the limitation is that not every survey is completed in full. And the one um, asterisk you see here, the note is made that of course, from a snowball sample, you don't have a perfect population, neither do you have a representative population. So it wasn't to test anything. It was really more to generate an understanding of what was going on. So it was trying to develop theory rather than verifying it. In terms of the participants, we had a 781 respondents. It was only open for the May 2020 from 70 countries worldwide, which is extraordinary when you think about, well, when one thinks about ending the globe, 70 countries is a lot. We divided our participants according to region, level of experience, years of experience in public and private in, um, institutions. Here you see the number of participants per region. It gives you a sense of the spread. It's 781 in total, there you go. Um, and here is a little chart of showing the seniority of people. Most respondents identified as mid-level to, sen uh, to senior student affairs managers. And the largest group were officers or entry level. And here, just a sense of uh, number of years working. Um, so that's it. Oh yeah, and this is also about the participants. 75% were public institutions. Um, and it gives you a sense of the size of the institutions here less than 5,000 students enrollment and so forth. More of this in those publications, it's too much detail here. So for now, I'm gonna give over to Brett, um, no, to Terry. Is Terry online with us? Hi, uh, hi everyone. Um, uh, Birgit, I am sorry, I have an error on my computer. Um, so it just started a half an hour ago. Can you please continue with uh, running through the findings for me? Um, I can hear you, I can see, but I can't really do the presentation. My computer's, I'm on the phone here. Oh, okay. But if you can see the screen, then you can talk. We don't mind not seeing you. No, no, please go ahead. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so I wonder if you can all see my face again. Brett, do you want to take this? Sure. Okay, if you start with the findings there. Okay. Um, I still would need you to advance, but I'm okay, okay to speak to them. There we go. Okay, so the the first section that we were looking at was what was happening with decision making. Um, kind of when did student affairs and services folks get involved, and what kinds of decisions were we basically involved with? And you can see here that. Student affairs was essentially a player. Um, this chart is the, the question during the pandemic, student affairs and services is a key player in institutional decision-making. That was the actual question we were asking folks here. And you can see for the most part, you've got a lot of blue on this chart in terms of strongly agree, um, and then agree after that. So the majority of folks is actually 86% indicated that student affairs was a key institutional decision-maker during this first 
a uh, few, actually um, the first few weeks of the pandemic, because the research we did was early on in the pandemic. It was fielded in May, in the month of May. So we had really been in the pandemic for about January for some countries, February for some others, and March pretty much for the rest of the world. Um, considerations for decisions. These actually became foundational pieces for the whole uh, study for us because what folks were essentially saying is that community safety was a critical aspect of the decisions that were being made. Teaching and learning was the second most cited uh, reasoning for uh, the decisions to be made. And then ethic and care. So, you know, an ethic of care, ethics and care for individuals, particularly for students, but also faculty and staff. Um, we, we broke down here a little bit that Europe, Oceania, and North America. So we did break things down essentially using the, the IASIS regions. Um, and so for those three regions, international students were some of the um, most impacted students, some of the key students that we were looking at in terms of decision making. And then Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Middle East it was more about residential students, um, particularly those who were living in residence halls. And I hope we have some time to talk about that because there's a whole slew of issues that tie into that issue as well. So our impact on student groups and services. This is a, um, a Qualtrics output that you can create that demonstrates the groups of students who are primarily impacted by COVID-19. Um, Across the board, international students were definitely the most impacted according to our respondents. However, there was a secondary, a strong secondary group that were essentially lower socioeconomic status students. Um, it also bled into rural students, students who had difficult home situations and students with, with disabilities. All of those students were cited as having significant impact from COVID-19. Um, this is something we, we wanted to just do kind of quickly and ask you all to do. I'm not, I'm not sure if you've ever done kind of a chat storm before, but we have a, a question that we'd like you to answer in the chat and then we respond all at the same time. And so we'd have to kind of scroll through the chat a little bit, but you can see the question here is, what are the factors in your students' context during COVID-19 that you believe created barriers for their success? So if you could take a moment, put in the chat, what do you think were some of these barriers that impacted uh, your students within your context? Okay, some folks are putting it in already. Mental health, connectivity, and go ahead and plop them all in when you're done. New home responsibilities, absolutely. Financial insecurity is huge. Feeling isolated and lost. Yes, mental health, again, poor connectivity, huge issue. Yep, access, connectivity, technology, food insecurity, absolutely. Mental well being, access, family circumstances. Oh my gosh, it's like, you all were participants in the study, apparently, because <laughs> this is definitely what we're seeing. Anxiety. You know, the one thing I haven't seen just yet that we did find, uh, particularly with international students, was fear, straight up fear that certainly went along with anxiety and mental health issues and probably access and all of those other issues as well. Uh, relationships. Absolutely. That's great. Fear of the uncertain. So thank you. Yeah, this is great. Um, feel free if other things come to mind, if you want to plop them in there, feel free to do that. And if you have questions at all, feel free to put those also in the chat. And Terry, we're going to ask you to, oh, you might not be able to monitor chat on the phone. So we're okay as is. Okay, why don't we move forward to the next slides? That's the next one. Oh, thank you. Um, so again, students most affected by COVID-19, we, we mentioned this, um, this is kind of the order in which, that, in, in which we saw them. The household situations, again, was really quite an issue. 
but obviously you're aware of a lot of those things given the chat in terms of isolation, living in rural areas. Um, and I like the last one I just saw, access to student services, because it isn't just access to courses and to online learning, but it's all of the support that we provide too, which actually we'll get to near the end of this presentation today. So our, and Birgit, if you wanna add anything as we're going, please feel free since we're um, tag teaming a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Contextual changes, uh, challenges, excuse me. So we mentioned home environments, society's norms. This is a key element of what we think are outcomes of this study in terms of societal norms and the need for us to contextualize. Um, what works we know in say Asia is not necessarily going to work in Latin America and the Caribbean. And those of us who are on this webinar, I think probably know and understand that, but it definitely came to light that there are varying contextual issues across all of these areas and certainly with a common impact. This is something we hadn't ever really had before. Here we have a global effect on everybody and how does that help us differentiate what we do? Some of the things in the second set here, safe running water, safe and running water, decent living conditions, electricity, access to food as some set and shelter. So in the United States, we think about this a little bit less. In some other areas, this is a major issue like Birgit and Terry have pointed out, um, access to electricity and clean water is an issue. Uh, and stable Wi-Fi is a little bit more cross-cutting around the globe. Um, Birgit, you wanna address the, uh, this slide on South African students? Yeah, I think why we inserted this is because we just had a publication where we extracted all the African data and compared it across the globe. And really what stood out that um, in the data for Africa we looked at was that it is, the universities were kind of considered as safe spaces and spaces um, to come back to. Um, and it is was and it was living and studying in the communities that was so hard. So the barriers to student success is is of course also on campus, but it's also and perhaps unnoticeably until now off campus. And that's why it's, we inserted the slide just to highlight that it is the factors beyond campus that matter too. Um, mm -hmm. This is a, a regional uh, difference. We have broken the data down in a, in a couple of different ways. And this is an Africa and Asia comparison where we had mentioned that in Africa, low SES students were of high consideration in making decisions. Difficult home situations was another major impact. Students with disabilities and international students. The stacking is slightly different if you look at considerations from the Asian region with difficult home situations being number one, lower SES number two, and international students generally being in the third position here. So a couple of comparisons between the two areas. Um, challenges faced by international students, I alluded to this earlier, emotional stress, 96%, 96% emotional stress, which is huge, obviously. Inability to re return home, this was, heart-wrenching really when you had closing borders and all manner of issues that students didn't have to just navigate one social context. They were navigating multiple social contexts. This was not and could not have been an easy situation. Financial hardships were huge. We saw that at our own institution. And I mentioned earlier the fear and uncertainty. Um, we explored discrimination a little bit in the survey. Um, interestingly, though, 75% of the respondents said that there was not discrimination against their international students. That was slightly different than our uh, general hypotheses, but the 25% who responded that there had been potentially some discrimination was focused primarily on international students and particularly students from Asia. Uh, specific services to international students. These were some of the services across the study, across the respondents that um, we basically said, here are things we want to do to try to help you. So student accommodation was huge. So some institutions had to close all of their residential facilities 
but lots of institutions kept their facilities open for international students, those who had difficult home situations, those who might live in the hinterlands or rural areas, uh, some of those remained open. Counseling and health services became huge. This has varied globally also. Did, did your institution go to telehealth? Um, did we shut down for a period of time and then open again? There was variation um, across the globe on this one. Financial assistance varied also in the forms of financial assistance that were provided. Uh, that varied by region as well. And I think we have a slide on that as well coming up. Um, it was nice to see staff support. The last thing I'll say on that slide. <laughs> Thanks, Birgit. Okay, let me move on. Um, here we have essential services. So one of the key questions we asked was, what services were deemed essential on your campus? And you can see here that counseling was huge. Um, healthcare varied substantially because in some countries, the health centers actually closed down and students were asked to go to community health centers. But in our survey, the world basically was saying, no, we're keeping these open. This is um, one of the pieces we did on a South Africa world comparison. Academic support, I think we all know we were key. Student affairs was key in helping with this transition to academic support, uh, keeping student centers open, a place for folks to gather. And you can see the largest discrepancy we saw here what between South Africa and the world was around residences in terms of keeping them open or closing those down. Maybe just to say that I think that that is a good example of where different regulatory bodies play a role. So there was a national decision in South Africa to close residences and that kind of forced everyone. So there was a sort of, um, yeah, so, so I think it was different bodies that made the decisions and that in South Africa had a huge impact. Um, thanks for the chat, uh, Dan. I've seen you've written a couple of things in there. I haven't been able to totally stay on top of it, but thank you. Good thoughts there. Um, our next slide, regional responses to five support provisions. So the, the top five provisions are cross-tabbed here with the regions. And so um, transportation money to students is that first kind of light blue line. You can see the significant differences here. Look, for example, between Africa and the Middle East in terms of transportation. Um, Oceana, I was actually slightly surprised by that because I know how important international students are particularly to that region. And I would have assumed transportation money would be higher. I'd even heard stories about sending charter planes. I'm sorry I'm speaking so quickly. We just, we have so little time. I'm trying to move pretty rapidly. Um, housing refunds, huge variation across region with uh, refunding housing. And then um, increase online specialists and consultants. This is relatively uh, static across the different regions, providing free online devices, relatively static, but yet super important and lowest in the Asia region. And then offering Wi-Fi hotspots, a similar concept, I would say, but yet there is um, some regional variation with Europe being the lowest there, which did surprise me just a wee bit. Perhaps again, what is interesting to say, Brett, I am just want to comment in one of Please. our comments. we were talking about that, how in Europe the Wi-Fi is so widely spread that the universities, of course, don't need to offer it. So they, they weren't bothered with offering it. Whereas in Africa, it was so essential that the universities themselves offer Wi-Fi hotspots and Wi-Fi access because it isn't widely available in the, in the towns and so forth. So it, this is an example of how when the macro, you know, if there's a system around you, a macro system and structure around you that has Wi-Fi, then the universities don't need to offer that. So the universities or student affairs offer and provide depending on what is, or dare I say, lacking or, or um, not sufficient in the environment. Does that, can you uh, take this slide yeah. also, Birgit, related to Africa? Yeah, so this is enhancing remote online access. This was about how much support was provided to students um, to study remotely. So here you see provided transport money, internet bandwidth, data was negotiated with service providers, laptops were provided, mm -hmm. free online devices, and then provided data. And you see again, the universities in Africa excelled or, or did more proportionally compared to the rest of the world. And I think it has to do with that 
um, these kinds of things weren't available naturally or in a in a you know in the macro system in the African context. You know, interestingly, um, our university is creating some sort of a system where we're going to be providing what free Wi-Fi access to our community. Mm. Um, I don't know the details of that, but we're using the pandemic relief funding from the US government to basically put up antennas that will provide Wi-Fi for our immediate geographic area. I think there will be some great benefits from that, but I have a feeling there'll be some challenges with that too. But mm. um, anyway, that was something I thought was really great. Yeah. Um, on this slide, the percentage of student affairs and services staff working remotely. This is super interesting. Now, remember, this is May of 2020. 83% um, of the staff that we surveyed were working remotely. And um, respondents from Asia noted that 75% of student affairs and services was working remote. Um, although um, I seem to recall in Asia that less than 50%, so you can see from this chart, the blue uh, line <laughs> bar, thank you, um, is, was the highest in Asia. Um, it may be a function of timing also because mm -hmm. this region was hit earliest. And so perhaps that's, um, but there are probably cultural variations as well that were driving the less than 50%. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wanted just to comment on this slide as well. I don't know if Jeremy Doughty is in the audience or with us here today, but he did a wonderful paper on the st uh, uh, stress that staff experienced during um, COVID. Mm. Um, I wonder if it's in the references, but that's a wonderful one to look up because I think our staff were burdened with all the changes and the difference, different work demands and different times and working from home. Yeah. Yeah, there was one question I just saw in, in the chat about free online devices. Um, there were institutions who provided free laptops and tablets and things like that in addition to Wi-Fi hotspots. So um, yeah, it, there, it was also devices as well as um, internet access. Mm. So both of those were provided. Um, okay, our uh, duration of pandemic financial impacts. So what this is saying in summary, 75% of respondents said the financial impact of COVID-19 on our institutions will last at least two years, if not more. Um, I think that is really fairly telling. Um, I think you can also see that um, it, the Asian region was feeling the financial crunch less or projecting in any way that there would be less of a financial impact, or at least it would last a little bit less time. Um, and you can, this varied quite a bit, as you can see from this bar chart, but the most significant to me, I thought was that the average 75% said two years or more, and, the, and Asia was closer to one year as an average. Okay, and then some future comments, some prognostication, I can't say it. So folks looking into the future, um, we're saying resoundingly 93%, if you add agree and strongly agree, um, that international mobility would be impacted. Um, unfortunate, but probably a reality that we have seen play out um, Consulates are closed across the globe, although they are starting to reopen, as I understand. Um, I would assume that international mobility here was both students and staff. So almost everyone was saying, we believe international mobility would be impacted. There are a series of items about um, what will internationalization mean for student affairs. Um, I find these results really pretty interesting because if you look, so improved internationalization and global collaborations is the first and most obvious one. I think that's great. Look at the, the next one, less international students, probably not as positive. Improved online service and communication with students, alumni and, par and parents, this is great. Negative impact, 
this is bad. <laughs> Less mobility, mobility education abroad, probably not great. Unknown, mm, more online modes of global engagement and then collaboration. So if you take them in total, we have more positive ones than negative ones, which I think overall is good. But the order of these I thought was really interesting. Um, we asked the questions, the question, what would, what would we do differently if we could do this over again? And for the most part, as you see here, almost everyone believed that their institutions acted uh, responsibly and in coordination um, with what they should be doing, essentially. 25% noted their institutions uh, had planned for this type of emergency. So conversely, 75% of all institutions sampled globally, we're saying we weren't necessarily compare, uh, prepared for this. And if we would do it again, um, what were potential missteps maybe that happened along the way? And what respondents said was, there was some lack of communication, some of the decisions that were being made weren't being made in a timely way. And not all of the leaders potentially who should have been included were included. And we took that to mean probably some of the student affairs leaders may not have been included in the way that others were hoping or respondents were hoping they would have been included. Um, innovative ways of responding. This is Africa specific, by the way. So this is a slide from Africa, innovative ways. Uh, Birgit, did you wanna take this one? No, just quickly that I think that this is the, we extracted that again for that publication. And it was lovely to see how many of the African institutions spoke about they moved quickly online they were very efficient around that they managed the institutional changes they provided equity of access so they helped people to get access to learning materials they communicated well um, there was the public health services stepped up so it, it appears that overall at the african universities there were some if you see the lower regions there and um, people were somewhat pleased with how um, that rolled out you can see much more of the innovations in the in the papers that we published so this is just an overview so we asked, what do you predict will be possible changes to student affairs and services as a result? Um, these are great, I think, to see increased online programs and support services, probably, <clears throat> excuse me, probably obvious. Student affairs jobs will drastically change. That was a little surprising, I suppose, to, to see that, but good to know folks are thinking that student affairs and services ever more important, absolutely some level of contradiction perhaps between number two and number three, um, but I see that positive. It, it don't, number three almost gives number two a positive spin that SAS jobs may change drastically. The reduced budget and staffing changes may not be as uh, positive as the others. And then challenge ing uh, student activities and engagement, making things a little bit more difficult as we go forward. And then we continue forward with a few more from that set about predictions, um, hybrid and blended SAS. I bet everyone on this webinar has experienced this so far. More health programming around COVID-19, online teaching and learning. Those of us who teach are ex probably experiencing that. Communication with students. While we had great communications with students, this will probably change as we go forward. And then upskilling for student affairs practitioners to learn more and continue to do well in our roles. So yeah, we have the discussion and implications slide. We wanted to quickly show you this, um, what we're calling a developing heuristic model. And the, the model is based on the data that we collected it is not necessarily a predictive model. It's more a way of conceptualizing um, globally student affairs and services. Uh, we're still working on this and there's some debate amongst us as well, which has been super lively and fun. But what, what we're basically saying here is we have several domains upon which student affairs and services impacts. And the personal domain is um, students personal beings, their identity, their religious affiliation, kind of who they are as persons, as individuals. And then the sociocultural domain um, deals primarily with um, family issues and family expectations, which vary widely globally. Um, what are those expectations of community and society and cultural norms and mores? And then the public domain 
being some of your basic services around shelter and clean water and food and what role does student affairs and services play in potentially mitigating some of those issues as well. And then the final domain is kind of that academic domain that we've played a huge role in helping students transition to this online learning. So it's more about courses and online learning access, those kinds of concepts related to uh, essentially their majors and their academic coursework. And so in what ways do we mitigate those kinds of things? And as Birgit likes to say, how do we level the playing field for our students? Um, Brett, if I can just add, um, add a little bit here. Um, we come from four different regions, our researchers, and they it's so interesting how different domains take on different weights and different power or different, um, um, yeah, I think it's a weight in terms of impacting student success. So I think um, if I look at North America, um, Brett, where you are, the student affairs in the academic life is very enmeshed and it's one. There's really, it's just hand in hand very, very closely. And mainland Europe, for instance, it's quite separate because student affairs is more embedded in the state service provision and the welfare provision. And so, you know, it, it, it morphs, it has a different weighting. This kind of model has a different weighting and looks different in different parts of the world. I think what is important though, is that student affairs is aware of these four domains and mediates them for students, depending on what students' needs are. Awesome, yeah, that's great. Um, I, as we get to recommendations and conclusions, I, I wonder, Terry, do you, we don't mean to exclude you <laughs> because of your access issues. Do you have anything that um, you want to say or chime in at all here as we're wrapping up? Uh, no, you are doing an excellent job. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I think I will chip in, I will chip into uh, uh, when the questions come. Um, okay, great. And we're doing great on time, it looks like. So we'll, we'll have 15 minutes um, for Q&A. Um, and I, I think we're probably there. I mean, our, our oops, I advanced on my slide here. So recommendations and conclusions. Um, we kind of discussed a little bit the, the nuanced nature of the responses. Uh, we're trying to portray that in our model to some extent that this is a complex situation a complex set of issues when we're dealing with higher education generally and, and SAS in particular. A couple of, of brief items for each of these kind of constituents as students, campus experience for the most challenged, uh, certainly socially, psychologically, physically, financially. We talked about the different student groups, uh, kind of groupings of students and populations that have been impacted. And then for staff training, our staff um, doing, we were actually one of the institutions who was actually relatively prepared for this. We have a, a really robust um, emergency preparation program. And so we were a little ahead of the curve in like March in the United States, but then by May, forget it. <laughs> the, the playing field had been equaled at that point, but at least we had a little bit of, of breathing room on the front end. Um, our institution making local differentiated and autonomous decisions. And you know the, these two I think tie together in terms of society and community, because we as researchers have talked a lot about how this has helped us reach out into the community. While this is differentiated by region, for example, our colleague Lisa in the UAE, they're primarily following what the Ministry of Education is saying that they will do. In other countries like Canada, they're following like what their provincial health organization is saying. And so there's a lot of opportunity here though for us to make connections in terms of decision-making. And I like this because it's expanding kind of our, our social capital and our reach and our ability to work together as institutions and society. And then finally the national piece, um, macro systems as we've talked about quite a bit in terms of um, electricity, we haven't talked as much about transportation, which is really huge and regionally varied, water, security, e-networks, access, and things like that. So these are some of the general kinds of concepts and recommendations that, that we would present. Mm -hmm. um, the, one, the one that we haven't emphasized um, in our model, uh, Brett, was the aspect that we want to also equip our students themselves to be agents 
of change and agents to advance social justice when they leave yeah. university. So while we do the work for making, you know, for, um, as you say, level the playing field for students when they're on campus for their learning, but we at the same time also, of course, enable them to be student uh, agents of change when they leave campus. Absolutely. Yeah, so these are the recommendations. Let me see if I can go on. Good. So there we are. So, so Brett, I'm unable to see chat because I'm sharing screen. So I'm relying on you or Terry to see the chat and respond. Or if okay. Um, I think you could probably end, stop the screen sharing at this point too. Okay. But um, yeah, I will put an eye to the chat. And if folks have questions, I was going, I actually opened a Word document to cut and paste um, while Terry and Birgit were presenting any questions. And so if there were some, I may have missed them. <laughs> and if you have any, please feel free to put them in there. We have a few other things that we can touch on if there aren't questions, but if you do have, um, and not just questions, but comments, um, you know, are, are absolutely welcome as well. I see um, one comment about, while well, the pandemic's highlighted the importance of student affairs programs and services, yeah, in our prior item three, the student affairs staff are most affected when it comes to budget cut and reorganization. This seems to be generally the case, I think, um, across the globe. We didn't specifically ask about that, but we did ask the questions about future orientation, where we think that was becoming clear that jobs and SAS budgets may change pretty significant. So I've just typed into the chat that you're welcome to raise your hand. That's probably the easiest if you want to want us to answer one of the questions. There've been so many. I've just logged on. I think there are over 60, no, 98 chats. Um, if there are any questions, please, if you can just raise your hand. And uh, Tad has helped us here too. It looks like Kathleen a few minutes ago had asked about how would SAS drastically change. Um, I, I would have to confess, I'm not sure we know specifically, we would have to follow up. Um, those were primarily qualitative answers that we coded into kind of higher level categories. Uh, so there actually may be some detail in the qualitative data. I'm not recalling it uh, off the top of my head. I don't know if Birgit and Terry might, but I think that is more of a roll up kind of a thing. So I think that um, it's quite interesting. We collected the data in May, and I think I've kind of lost, you know, we've learned quite a bit since then. Um, the one concern that I think is coming up more and more is that as learning is shifting to online environments, um, there are all kinds of things lost to a student experience on campus. So students are on campus not just to have to be satisfied or to have a good time, but to learn things about diversity, about transformation, about all kinds of diversities about conflict resolution or communication and um, relationships, all kinds of things that can only be learned in the space together when they're together. So if we don't have that, there's a whole dimension, there's a whole layer of higher education that is missing if, um, if our students are not coming to campus in diverse groups. A lot of students come from quite homogenous backgrounds and the first time they see the diversity, not just race and gender, all kinds of orientations and religious diversity is when they come on campus. And that is when they need to flex their muscle, practice things um, in order to learn these things for when they go and work. And if we don't have them back on campus, I'm not too sure how we can do that in online environments. So that's one area I'm concerned about. Uh, it looks like uh, Dr. Islam has raised yes. his hand. You have a question? Yes. Comment? Thank you. Yes, greetings from Bangladesh. I'm Shafiul Islam. Um, teaching at the University of Rajshahi, Bangladesh. I would like to know how we can help our students who live in remote areas, that means in rural areas. How can we help them? First, your suggestions, please. Brett, do you want me to respond a little bit on that? Yeah, a, a couple of items that, that come to mind um, based on our study. Uh, the first is uh, transportation issues. If indeed campuses are open and classes are uh, being held in person or a hybrid format, helping students actually gain access physically to the campus could be one way to assist. Now there are obviously costs associated with that, so it's not going to apply unilaterally, but transportation I think might be one of those. 
The other from our research, and we had a question earlier, are potentially providing um, devices that can help students access remotely. But we know, as you're stating in your question, Dr. Islam, that it uh, may be difficult to have access to Wi-Fi in remote spots. Maybe Wi-Fi hotspots could work, but there are also limitations to those as well. So I think those three things come to mind to me initially, um, transportation, uh, devices to help students access, and then Wi-Fi ability for them to access the internet. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. can I add a little bit? So rurality means something different in different spaces. Um, in, in context that I'm familiar with, rurality also means not just not having access to data and um, you know those kinds of things, but it also is about social norms and about cultural practices that might make it hard for students to study. It might be gender roles, it might be um, all kinds of expectations when people study in rural areas, what they do at home, what is appropriate, um, and also access to water and safety and all kinds of other things. Um, so that's that fourth element we were mentioning earlier on that we want to develop our students to become agents of change. So students need to be equipped to be able to make a change where they are, where they live. It's very difficult to change things in rural areas. Um, and but we can help students to do that for themselves. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I wouldn't want to put that kind of burden on students' shoulders, but fundamentally to make sure that our students are agents of social justice when they leave university, I think is one of the important aspects so that we so that our rural areas do change. Yeah. And there are a couple of items in the chat too about um, partnerships with local network providers to provide zero rated data. Um, and I, I also, there are a couple of other things where Andrew, um, Andrew West, thanks for being here. And you had mentioned a pivot to online delivery may be considered drastic by some. And I think that's probably right. I, I see Kathleen has given a thumbs up with that too. <laughs> um, and Kathleen, you had um, submitted um, a note here too. Did you wanna uh, make a couple of comments related to that? I mean, no need, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I saw you had chatted. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I, I was just kind of curious as to what was considered drastic um, for student affairs, like, like our jobs are gonna be obliterated or we're all gonna go online or um, and some of the things that you talked about. I obviously am a huge proponent of student affairs and believe that we are essential to the growth and development of our students. And so um, in my mind, we won't be eliminated, but I want to, to hear what's happening with other people if that's a reality. Um, that makes me very sad. And thank you for all the work that you're doing on this. This is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I fear in the time we have left, I wouldn't be able to pull up our data to get to um, what was in this roll up of drastic, although there were a lot of comments and I would almost say fear, I think Terry and Birgit, that might be accurate of staff members about jobs and potential reorganizations and budget cuts and implied in that I think are maybe sometimes SAS is seen as first. And actually I have seen some articles since then, even in like University World News where student affairs areas are experiencing a little bit more of um, budget decision-making than some other areas. So I think it is partly a reality as well. Um, let's see, Summer has a comment as part of the student services team college mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So, yeah, I wanted to mm -hmm. respond to that. That was an interesting one that students might not be making use of all the offerings as much as we're offering. Um, and I think that that's a similar thing we're finding with teaching and learning that's done online. So the lecturers, if you look at lecturer surveys, um, the lecturers will say, well, I had a consultation time and nobody emailed me or I offered a chat facility and nobody emailed. So there is somewhat of a paralysis um, for some students, that's true. They do that in the teaching and learning environment that's online as well in the student affairs. So when we offer support, they don't really grab it. Um, and we know, I imagine, I mean, it has to do with that we can't reach all students or some student groups are difficult to reach. 
and just sending online messages is kind of a, you know, it's almost a one dimensional way of reaching them. I'm not sure how else we can reach them, but in reaching them in just online appeals or in online invites um, is quite hard and not everybody responds to that. So you're quite right. We're not reaching everyone. No, no. Mm -hmm. um, we did note that student affairs staff did pivot fairly quickly and maintained solid connections with students. Um, that's something that Lisa has talked about quite a bit as the fourth person of our team, that there have been um, new and new ways of communicating with students, but using virtual technology, most students were relatively comfortable, but not all students were relatively comfortable with that. But staying in touch with students during the pandemic seems to have been a theme that we were able to do that and able to provide feedback and information to others about uh, what our students were thinking and feeling. Not that that always translated to the decisions, but we were able to communicate. And maybe that will help us going in the future also about the uptake of using our services and things. In the United States, we're, as a matter of fact, just this morning, uh, a lawsuit was allowed to move forward for students who are suing that they paid student fees but didn't get the services that they thought they deserved. And some might argue those services were potentially there in different ways, um, but how do we do that going forward, I think is a question. Uh, I can just respond to last item, Brett, sorry, I've just gotten a reminder. Absolutely. Your host that we've got two minutes left. Um, something that featured a lot in our data was the communication with students and to students. And I think that is kind of significant, uh, symptomatic of the need to be in relationship, the need to be connected. It wasn't just about sending emails that something opens at three o'clock or forms are here. And you know, it wasn't just a sort of transactional communication, but it was also about offering a conduit to the institution. It offered a relationship to the institution and it was symptomatic of um, perhaps how barren the world was when one was living in COVID and how desperate people were or students were for being in relationship with us, with staff, with each other, with the institution. So I think the communication really stood out um, and, and that being a symptom of something, um, I think much more significant. Brett, I'm gonna ask us to close down. We've got another minute. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, apologies, of course, from Thierry. He's been sending me messages on the side saying he cannot get on with the camera. Um, he's in Cape Town. We hope at least your weather is good while you're there, Thierry. Um, <laughs> Um, from the rest of us, Lisa Bardell in um, United Arab Emirates is unable to join us today. Um, so we also want to thank her for all the work she's done on this research, of course. Um, and then thanks from my side um, for so many people, so many of you joining from such diverse regions of the world. It's lovely to be able to share this with you. Indeed, very energizing. Thank you for joining with us today. Yeah. Thank you all. We're going to shut down this room. Thank you very much for seeing you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank, thank you, you, Brett and Birgit, for stepping up. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. No problem. You would do it for us and have. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Best of luck, to everyone. Thanks so much, you friend. Is that Letitia talking? Yes. Recognize your voice. Hi, Birgit. How are you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thank Wonderful engagement. Thank you. Thanks for your question.